No, I can pray. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to get together. Thank you for giving us to each other. Thank you for gathering us, oh Father, and um, that we are able to be gathered through, though we are so far away. Oh Heavenly Father, please give us wisdom right now, wisdom to understand and perceive, and with wisdom to retain what we learn, that we may be able to use it um, when, when we need it. Oh Heavenly Father, please give wisdom to the person, the presenter, and in especially bless, bless with, uh, with uh, confidence and with uh, quick um, uh, to be able to come up with the right answer. We pray and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Sister Elaine, are you ready for me? Yes, but um, I heard from Sister Christine that she didn't have notes typed up, so I don't know what. No. I didn't. So, go ahead. I'm sorry. Was there something I need to share screen? Because I didn't see anything. Uh, I I WhatsApped both you and uh, Christine because I'm I'm not confident in my internet connection because it it drops sometimes, but I so I have a call in but i also have the, the video um so i shared with both of you guys the picture of my board okay i'll get it up okay so what i what i'll do is just kind of talk and make notes over um if i can let's see well Maybe. Oh, okay. Is that is that okay for everybody the way that I did it? Yes. Uh huh. I'll see it. Okay. Okay. Well, you can or you can download it and just share the picture only. That way, we will see just the picture. Yeah. Well, if you don't mind waiting for me for a second, then. Well, I do that. No, go right ahead. And no, I don't see how I can share in the chat. <laughs> okay. This was Australia. Uh oh. Where'd my volume go? You guys still hear me? Yes. Okay. I should be able to you hear go you. Go ahead whenever you want. I'm working on. Okay, that. there we go. I'm sorry. Repeat that. No, you go ahead whenever you're ready, and I'm gonna. Work, I'm working on getting this shown a better way. Okay. Okay. Um. Sorry, I'm still kind of learning this myself. Um. Let's see if all oh, if this will make it easy for the time being. Okay, and then you guys be ready to share it too, because in case my feed goes down. Um, but I'm so I, I'm presenting Tessa's study in October 10th on um, the titled "Apis Bowl: A Warning," and and then that, that's on the um, the Midnight Watch YouTube channel. So I'm going to ask everybody a question and feel free to um, to just vocalize or to share in the chat. Um, 
what you've discovered is the, you know, just listening to Tess and Parmender both talking about the Apis bull, what are some of the reasons why we've been looking at that? So I'm asking you all to, to participate. To, to understand a lot of things, but to understand idolatry and trace it through the history of the dispensations. Okay, I want us to get a little bit deeper in to what that means. So Christine in the chat. Um, oh, Adriana says, understanding conservative, uh, conservatism. Christine says, because we are not understanding correctly. And Elaine adds, and headship. Um, yes. To all of those, um, there is, okay, I'm going back to the, the chat. Um, so I think we can still go deeper with this. Understanding our idolatry, yes, yeah, so that's the. Um, I think perhaps, I, I think this is mm -hmm. a way that we want to understand God. Mm -hmm. And so when we don't understand, although we have the desire to, we create God in what we think. So basically in our own image, we create mm -hmm. this God that we really want to know. Mm -hmm. And what does that image actually resemble more, more closely? Sister Adriana says, we are learning, we are attracted to the wrong thing for a leader. Sister Elaine says, true and the false. So I, I couldn't see who it was that spoke last, if that was Brother Fell or Robert. Um, you're right. Okay. If you can develop your thought a little bit more, because that's, that's along the lines of where I'm going. So just repeat what you what you said, if, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, what I said was that um, I think we all have a desire to understand God. Um, mm -hmm. But we end up, because we have the wrong image, we end up creating a God in our own image in trying to understand there you uh, go. Mm -hmm. the real God. So we are creating God in our own image. That was the, um, like the, the point that I, I wanted to get at. That I was seeing Tess bring to, to light in this presentation, and then just what a blessing today, both with the desire of ages, with the McIntyre's uh, Sabbath school study, emphasizing again these points but also um, Elder Parmender's continuous um, uh, discussion on the topic. So having an incorrect understanding, not just of God, but of any relationship we have, of, of thinking that, again, this goes to the headship, right? That if um, I'll use the female perspective since that's what I can relate to, uh, you know, a woman being being brought up, reinforced, reinforcing the ideas of uh, finding a strong man to protect her and to care for her and um, you know, shield her from any dangers within the world. And, and then the man not being, and, and that completes the woman, and or yes, that man completes the woman, and then vice versa, the man not being complete without uh, the woman to bring fertility, to bring um, children. 
And so this is a very sexist way of, of looking at any relationship, whether it's um, partnership relationship, whether it's friend relationship, especially when it's um, when it's our creator or God personal relationship. So with with that in mind of, of just trying to bring out um, those points that we have come to understand about the importance of the Apis bull. You know, so yes, it, it has that um, that significance within relationships. It also has that significance within the church, the uh, the false understanding of who God is, of legalistically trying to follow uh, laws that God established for us, but not following them the way that God wants us to, but following them the way that uh, tradition has established or what um, what our elders in the past have said that we need to adhere to. So how I structured today was um, a little bit more um, of like taking direct quotes from uh, from Elder Tessa's presentation and then um, just trying to tie it all together. So most of what I'm saying is actually going to be verbatim of Tessa's words. And there are times when I notice that Elder Tess is, is speaking as um, in first person, sometimes she's speaking as third person. So sometimes she's an observer and, and just placing herself, using herself as an example for, um, you know, exchangeable for any one of us rather than uh, speaking as, you know, elder tests being used as an example. And I, I think you'll, you might understand, uh, maybe I'm not explaining that well, but I think you might understand when I get to those, uh, to those parts. So, and then also in the top right corner, you can see the date. I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, so however you write the date, if it's, um, you know, the day, then the month, and then the year or the month, day and year, 14 and 11 is 25. So today is kind of a 25-20. So happy day to all of us. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to begin with, with Tess's words. It's imperative that we follow the development of the message. If we don't, one day we'll hear the message say something that we don't expect coming. And many people who think their faith is strong enough find themselves shaken out of this movement. When that happens, when that happened, when they find something that, um, they don't expect coming. And there's a danger in this time of trouble that as people's concerns heap around them, they cease to follow the steady steps of the movement, distracted by other things. And she uh, references Pilgrim's Progress um, just as a, that we can see the themes in Pilgrim's Progress um, with what we're dealing with during the time of trouble, people's concerns heaped around them. And so she's wanting to encourage people to, to question, to, to send questions so that they can be answered. Um, she actually has more concerns when there aren't any questions being asked because that's, that's a fear that can um, manifest into something real. If there are too many who are not um, who aren't speaking out for you know just something that that doesn't connect for them that they're they're too and I can speak for myself um, because I'm 
brand new, not just to the, the movement, but to Adventism. Um, so September of 2017 was my very first uh, class to attend at FFA. And that was my very first introduction into Adventism. I started watching the videos um, in February, March of 17. But that, there were just so many questions. But I knew that, um, I knew that they would get answered, but at the same time, um, you know, if I were to apply that approach now, I would be one of these people who would be surprised by something and uh, might have been, you know, shaken away, um, might have, have left because, well, I was, I was expecting one thing, but yet the studies took us another direction. So it's really important not to let any questions to fester and um, in so seeds of, of doubt. We need to keep up with the advancing steps of the movement. We are past the increase of knowledge way mark. God is shining light upon this movement. It has been coming for some time now and it's advancing rapidly. If we aren't following the increase of knowledge, when it's formalized, it'll come as a surprise and we won't be ready. Every dispensation has a testing message. So every dispensation has people who fail that test. And she's really working with us so that we pass those tests. This dispensation will be no different. In the Sabbath presentations in Oceania, which is the Island of the Sea uh, YouTube channel, um, that would be the week prior, so I guess around October 3rd, and then um, October 10th. She's, they've been discussing methodology, and um, it's really important for people to ask their questions, in particular about methodology, so that the foundation is solid that we're working with. And they also did a study or tested a study last year com um, that compared and contrasted the external and internal changes of leadership. And what people were asking is if Trump loses this election, there's another change in leadership in America. And so they were also asking, does that mean that there's an internal change of leadership in this movement? And she, instead of answering that question directly, she chose to look instead at why, why people thought, why she thought people were acting or were asking that question. And the reason that she thought people were asking that question is because they're still, or I guess I should say we or still having some confusion about how we treat reform lines and fractals. So there are two other meetings on the midnight watch on fractals, and that's also October 10th. Um, does anybody remember what the, there are two types of fractals. You can remember uh, what those are called. Well, one I already told you. Um, are they self-same and quasi? Yes. So quasi-fractals and fractals. Um, and if you look at the board, the very top line, the long line, the Eden, um, the line of restoration of Eden to Eden, that um, would be like, oh, well, that's just, that's not, a, a fractalized pattern that's simply a line of progression, but we take portions of the line of progression and we make um, applications to that. So bringing our attention back to the board, she, 
she has these two underneath the, the long line, there are um, two different appearances of lines, right? There's the, um, we have the alpha history, and then on the far right, we have the omega history. So the alpha history has an F by it. That's the um, alpha history failure. And then there's a middle section of history that's also a line of failure. But then the, um, the last, the omega history is the, uh, the success. So you can tell just by looking at the structure of those, of those two groups of lines that they're different one, you know, one side to the other side. Um, but so one without labeling these one, the alpha uh, failure could be um, ancient Israel or uh, could be modern Israel, right? Because they both have the same structure, but the alpha of uh, ancient Israel does not have the same appearance of the omega of ancient Israel or even of modern Israel. So even if we go to um, the Millerite line and the, um, the alpha of that being 1798, then looking at what our omega line of success is, there are, there are things that are true about um, Millerite and Adventism history applications that are true that wouldn't be true about the Omega, the success history of, of the 144,000. So this is where we need to be very mindful of what type of fractals we're dealing with. And so this is why it's really important, she emphasized, to review those two videos. And again, it's the same same day, October 10th, um, 2020 on the Midnight Watch. Very, very good studies to, um, to not just watch, but to internalize and to, to practice the lines and understand uh, which, which are which and how to make the proper applications. So because we're dealing with the methodology of fractals, and that's going to be important to understand going forward, test begins by introducing a couple of thoughts. Beginning in May, a series began in Australia, beginning with a study titled The Apis Bull. The intention was for that to bring us to a study of Millerite history. And in some ways it has, but with a few tangents. She knows that there are questions about the subject of Sabbath and Sunday in Millerite history. So the intention is to target uh, that question. And she asks that you do your own study in preparation with the two studies on fractals. So what's drawn on the board is, on her board at first, it was, um, it was very vague what, uh, what she's talking about. Like to begin the study of the Apis bull, she drew the alpha or the omega lines but didn't specify the alpha histories and also um, the history in the middle. Now the structure, it could apply to ancient or modern Israel until you start labeling way marks. You don't know if she's drawn ancient or modern. 
the uh, I'm going to draw our attention to the alpha of um, I'm sorry the omega uh, success the uh, the top line where that crosses. No, I'm sorry. Where does she point that out? Well, that's not where the cross is, sorry. So um, I'm forgetting where she's pointing to, but um, she's saying that this could be 34 AD or the Sunday law. And so that's gotta be um, after the cross, thank you. So um, it is the cross line. I don't know why I was getting mixed up there. So that line could be 34 AD if we're looking at um, the ancient Israel or um, the Sunday law, modern Israel. But this is the beginning and end of history of Israel, whichever Israel it is. In the Omega history, there's one call to the world. And there's two calls to the church. And she hopes that everybody in the movement is now comfortable with that. Where you could go to ancient or modern Israel and label every one of those way marks. And if you have time before the end of the day, just pull out a piece of paper and just draw those lines yourself. Just practice as much as possible. That way it'll retain in your mind. Now at the top is the long line. It's the line of Eden to Eden. And we know the line, and we know the end Eden comes after 1,000 years. So she's speaking about the time on earth. So the, the time on earth is what she's going to be focused on rather than um, the end Eden after the thousand years. We're just going to be focusing on what happens on earth. But to keep in mind the study of Eden to Eden in this discussion of ancient Israel within the context so of looking at ancient Israel within the context of the Eden to Eden line, just hold that understanding uh, within your mind while we're looking at uh, the different histories in their proper context. So you have Eden. And if you can see, so you have Eden and then there's a, a downward arrow underneath Eden that points to, to sin. And then there's a curse because of the fall, uh, because of the fall from Eden. And then to the flood in very general terms. And just within that history, there's 1,500 years. So from when Eden began to the flood is 1,500 years. And then about two and a half thousand years after the fall, you come to the beginning of ancient Israel. So from Eden to the flood is 1,500 years. And then to Moses is another 1,000 years. So from Eden until Moses, that's 2,500 years. I don't think, or well, for me, that, that hasn't been a concept I've really wrapped my head around. So it just makes complete sense that we would have a large distance towards the end of our history, the thousand years after the second advent to the restoration of Eden, where it just it balances the equation. 
it makes the chiasm even. But the point that she wants to make is that you have the flood 1,500 years after the fall. And how much do they have written about God? There's nothing written about God. Why is that? Why isn't there anything written about God? And I'm, I'm asking you, I, you all to participate to answer that. Why is there nothing written in that? Uh, to, I, I, yeah. If, if I could, ahead. in Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen White said that the first um, approximately a thousand years that people lived long, right? I mean, we know that Methuselah and the, you know, antediluvian generation, they used to live very long and they didn't have written record because they were, they had, they were pretty close to the um, beginnings of the creation where they were, they were, they had, you know, they had pretty good uh, memories and their ability to retain and, uh, and uh, pass that information intact was very good. In fact, she says that they benefited greatly from the length of their life as well because they perfected the whatever the skills and the knowledge that they developed so that and they didn't need to record it because, you know, um, a grandson could just walk in and ask Adam about, you know, you know, like they could um, their abilities were much more perfect in that sense that they they were and their lives were were long. And mm -hmm. yeah, their mental capacities were much more um, uh, less damaged by the by the um, further, you know, by sin. So yeah, mm -hmm. that could be the answer. Great, thank you for that input. And then uh, Brother David also adds in the chat that it's because of um, the photographic memories that the um, that the people have. So both of those are, are absolutely correct. Um, that there, there isn't written any Old Testament scriptures in that 1500 years. And for much of that time, Adam is still alive. Um, but even after he's not, there's still others. And they are telling people because the people have a really good memory. They don't need to, um, they don't need to have any outside help or, you know, an aid in, in rem remembering. And so, of course, we come to understand that those people were very intelligent. And yet, at the flood, only eight people are saved. So they are intelligent in some respects, but their memories, their minds are much more exact than ours. There was no need of writing, but they also didn't have that. They didn't have the written word. People didn't write. The invention of letters had not yet begun. It wasn't even necessary. Then you come to the time period after the flood and what starts happening to their lifespans. It rapidly shrinks, right, by hundreds of years. So there is this deterioration. Written language is beginning to be introduced. Because it's just quite, it just quite frankly starts to become needed. It's now necessary to keep records. And so the knowledge of God starts getting transmitted into written form. But still, two and a half thousand years after the fall, that has not been formal, uh, formalized, formalized. It becomes the work of Moses. So two and a half thousand years later, the people have been in Egypt for about 400 years. They have themselves lost the knowledge of God. Humanity is forgetting his character. And this is a crisis. So at the time of the end, there's the raising up of Moses. Beginning of ancient Israel, he leads out the people. So you can see how the line of progression, um, we don't write out the steps, or I didn't 
test didn't write out the steps of Moses' reform line. Instead, she just creates these uh, template lines underneath that we can mentally um, string together ourselves. So the the beginning of ancient Israel, Moses is leading out the people. And there's something else he's going to do for the people. And I'm going to ask for um, a couple of volunteers. You can see, hopefully, there's it's big enough to see in the bottom center the boxed um, area. It has a couple of quotes in there that I'm going to ask uh, for people to um, to grab, to copy and paste, and put into the the chat. The first one is review and herald. January 9th, 1894. And I could not, <laughs> I just had a lot of difficulties um, searching Ellen White for that, uh, especially for the, um, the exact quote that she's uh, highlighting. I don't know, I didn't even find a paragraph um, form. So what she's bringing out with the Review and Herald article, the quote begins, they, the Israelites, had been corrupted by idolatry. Or if it's not a direct quote, it's um, Tessa's paraphrase. So try and picture the big picture of what has happened. Personal contact between God and Adam and Eve comes to an end. 1,500 years of word of mouth, understanding the character of God. Then we have the flood. A thousand years of that deterioration, the people do not have anything in writing to hold on to. The word of mouth is failing them. They're surrounded by Egyptians and, and idolatry. And Moses is a part of that, is he not? For all of his good qualities, Moses is a part of the same system, damaged by the same system. So Tessa's asked this question before, who understands God's character better? You or Miller. This should be simple. So who understands God's character better? You or Martin Luther? She thinks that you would say you. Who understands better? You or Peter, the character of God? You or John the Baptist? You or Moses? I hope that answer would be you. Because you can see that all of these people have some shortcoming. Whether it's, you know, it's one system or another. It's idolatrous, um, wrong understanding of God's nature. Because we're a thousand years, because we're a thousand years in, Abraham did not know that slavery was a sin. So a thousand years into the history of earth, Abraham did not know that slavery was a sin. They didn't understand polygamy, not all of them. There was much lacking. That is what the study of Eden to Eden teaches us. It's clear in this study that God is restoring his image. If he's restoring it, it's a process. Not just over your lifetime, but a 6,000 year process. 
it's going to need another thousand years in heaven. So that's why we're given that time so that we can, we can get things right. We can, we can partake in God's progressive restoration of his image within us. So Moses is a part of the same damaged system. He's trying to lead a people damaged by that system. They are corrupted by idolatry. They have no written word to turn to. So God leads them into the wilderness. And this is covered more fully in uh, the full Apis Bull study. Um, But she's not going to go into that. We know what happens in the wilderness. They reach a point in this time period where they make themselves the golden calf. So this is where we look at the alpha uh, failure history. And you can see right at the the end of the first um, the first group that's the um, Well, my brain just short circuited. So, um, where they are in in this actual literal history of Moses is um, is Rama, and and this is where, or maybe not yet. They're still at the um, sorry. They're still at Mount Sinai. Um, And so we dropped down, or Tess uh, drops down that history of the Apis Bowl, of where where that idol is made. And so the golden calf is the Apis Bowl. And in this time period, they're damaged by idolatry. And idolatry says, if you want to be safe, what do you need? The strong, warlike God King, right? If the people say that they want a strong leader, then they're going to um, they're going to form the strong leader after something that they've already seen. They, they aren't um, satisfied with where Moses is. They can't find him. So they create this idol. And the idol is the calf or the apis bull because that's what they made a lot of in Egypt. And they're looking for safety. They're looking for protection. And idolatry answers that question with, of what do I need to be safe with strong, warlike God King who's going to kill all your enemies, but they can't see God. Moses has disappeared. So they're going to create the Apis bull of the Egyptians. And this other quote, I could not find at all. Uh, She takes it from the SDA Bible commentary. And I put in the quotes trying to find the, um, the right or the phrases that she used. And I just couldn't bring it up. Um, But the SDA commentary says the following. The calf would naturally suggest itself to the Israelites. An Israelite then would naturally think to build the golden calf because in Egypt, they'd watch the worship of the Apis bulls. And as a side note, in their excavations, they found the burial chambers of the Apis bull in 1850. 
And so we know, too, that in 1798, they found the Rosetta Stone. So it's really interesting. The Rosetta Stone allows for uh, all languages to be um, to be translated, all of the the ancient uh, languages to to have a common foundation that modern language can build off of. So in 1850, they find the burial chambers of the Apis bulls. That's a side note. So. They're not going to say that this is the Apis bull, right? The Hebrews and all of those that came out of Egypt who build this golden calf, they, Aaron doesn't say, look upon this golden calf. This is the Apis bull who carried you out of Egypt. They say, this is the God. This is, this, these are the gods. I think it's the, the right term, but the, the people believe that this is God. That's why I put it in, in quotation marks, uh, so you can see it towards the bottom uh, of that, so the, the three blank lines uh, under the bottom line on the, towards the, the left is Apis bull equals God. And I have that in quotes because the people aren't calling this, this idol anything other than God. They're not realizing that it's a counterfeit. They are subscribing all of these uh, characteristics onto this calf, the, the characteristics of God. They're subscribing to this calf. This is a representation, but they, they're just saying that the bull is what he looks like, that this is a representation of him, so they aren't saying that they're worshiping an entirely different god. Instead, they're taking the character of the apis bull and subscribing it to God because they want a strong warlike god a God King who's going to kill their enemies. In that study, we go through the characteristics of the Apis bull. And so she's pointing us back to the, the first one that she did. And it has been, it had to be born by miraculous conception, the, the Apis bull. Um, it has to be seen to have it, a fighting spirit. So these are the, uh, the items numbered towards the bottom left of the board. Because they want a warlike god king who's going to kill their enemies, they see that it has to have a miraculous conception. It was seen to have a fighting spirit. So the miraculous conception, just to kind of refresh your memory, is um, they used to think that um, like lightning would, would strike one of the, um, uh, the cows in the, in the pasture. There would be different, um, like a, a pattern, a, um, I don't even know what that's called, like just a different, um, speckled pattern, a particular um, spotting on these, on these cows that would be characteristic of this um, miraculously conceived, you know, the lightning strike was, was a, a symbol of God um, you know, incepting itself into this, this creature. But the so other than the miraculous conception, it also had a fighting spirit. It was pictured as tearing down the walls of the city. It was a symbol of strength and fertility. And a lot of Egyptian male kings were sometimes referred to as a strong bull. They had courage and strength and a fighting spirit, conquering of enemies 
and kingship. All these things that they were talking, that they were taking from the ape of bull and subscribing to God. Then we looked at their, at their issues once they entered Canaan. They're in a city called Ramah, which means the seat of idolatry. And what do they ask for? They ask for a strong king. Why? Because all these characteristics of this idol that they've transcribed unto God, that they were also wishing to see in Moses, they still want. So over here in Ramah, they're going to ask for the apis bull. And God says, if that's what you want, that's what you'll have. They come out of Babylon. You can see in the, the middle, there's another uh, failure history in the, in the very middle. There's a, an F and then it says Babylon. So they come out of Babylon. They're cured of building any more images. So they're cured of the form because there are two, um, two things that we know that idols represent. They represent the form and the character. Or, or, I'm sorry, not just idols, but also uh, God. He has a form. He also has um, character and we're trying to understand not just his form but also his character and we're using the counterfeit to compare and contrast to see who God is more clearly by looking at how these idols were understood in their original history so they come out of Babylon they're cured of building any more images, but the problem was it was never just the image. It's the image, the form, and the character. They came out of Babylon cured of the form. They are not going to build any more statues. Associated with that image are two things, form and character. But the greatest danger that they had, that they had, that they held on to back there was not just the form. The fact that they'd subscribed the character of the idol to God, because after all this time, they no longer knew what God's character looked like. And if you don't know what God's character looks like, you're going to mold something with your own hands. As Brother Saul says, said earlier, so they come into the Omega history. So that's the um, the area towards the right of the board, and we're going to look at the uh, priest line of the Omega history because then at that time they were looking for the Messiah. John was teaching at the the time of the end is when um, we see John and Jesus both emerge. But prior to the 9-11, the, the baptism history, John is teaching. And they are steeped in idolatry. John is saying, there's this great warrior king rising up. He's going to clean out the house of God and destroy the Romans because John is steeped in idolatry as are all the people around him, his father, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. So when Jesus comes, he came in his humiliation to our earth. No conquering armies were visible. No conquering armies were visible to the human eye. And the unbelieving Jews decided that he could not be the illustrious king for whom they were looking. So they rejected the son of God. When he was standing right in front of them, they could not recognize him. 
because while they might have destroyed the form of idols, they've never destroyed the character of their idols. So all through their history, they're looking to God as having the same character as the idols they see in paganism. However, however moral they are in this history, however stringently they keep the Sabbath, however stringently they keep all of the laws, they completely misunderstand the character of God. And if we were to go back to Exodus 20 and read um, 18 to 22, and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings. Oops, I see a chat. Sister Elaine says, they didn't understand what he came to conquer. Exactly. That's a great point. They're expecting him to to conquer the Romans, and he came to conquer sin. So we're looking at Exodus 20, and we're reading 18 to 22. And again, I don't, I don't think she quotes uh, the whole section, just parts of it. Ooh. Ah! Oh. All right, I just lost my... I stand. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So they're keeping the laws very stringently, but they're misinterpreting um, God's character. And so we look at Exodus 20, 18 to 22, and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountains smoking, the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they were moved and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, speak thou with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. So the 10 commandments have just been pronounced and the people are terrified. And they said, don't let God speak to us again. He can speak to Moses. Mo Moses can tell us, but don't let God speak to us again. And Moses said unto the people, fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that you sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near under the thick darkness where God was. To paraphrase certain portions of Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 22, I'm sorry, chapter 27. Um, and I wrote down several of the, um, the exact pages and, and paragraphs. Hopefully you guys can see that okay. Do me interrupt, Sister Alyssa. I just wanted to, yeah. say, to hear a personal testimony that this very, the way she put it, the way she read it, and the way Elder Tess explained it, you know, I never saw it that way before. I really, yeah, you know, I, when the way I saw in the Old Testament, God, in, in, in all cases to me, it sounded like this, this, the God is strict in the, um, and, you know, he's picky, he has favorites. And, but when she showed that, you know, it sounded like God never meant for, for just Moses to be the only one to go up to that mountain, but it's mm -hmm. the people that asked for it. That is so yeah. shattering. And that is so revealing of the God's character that it was the people that said, no, we renounced that. We don't want that privilege. You go us, yeah. go for us. We don't want to do that. That is so yeah. striking, which means that God, God's character right there was revealing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, and that really is, you know, shows that God was ever, uh, you know, he, he was always, he had no favorites. He had, you know, he, he wishes that all of us be saved and all of us be 144,000. Yeah. Amen. And um, the, um, you raised a, a 
point that Tess emphasized um, that God is actually giving them what they want. You know, even when they ask for a king uh, instead of judges, they their request is answered. God does that. It's it's not um, the thing that struck me most kind of along the lines of like realizing that all these people are terrified of God, so they ask not to be in God's presence, not to be like Moses. Um, is this this understanding of um, so the people don't actually think that they are doing anything wrong, right? They're, they think that they are worshiping God, but it's not God. It's their, their thought form. It's, their, it's the work done by their hands. It's, and it's something that, I mean, you know, God can't just, look them in the face, just appear to them and say, uh, no, because he already knows that they're, that, you know, that would either kill them from fright or um, that it would be like, you know, to use a very crude analogy, like, you know, one of us looking down at uh, an ant, you know, that type of of um, difference, so to speak, in um, seeing ourselves as, um, you know, as people, but, but yet in this relationship, being like ants and not having the ability to comprehend that there's a person standing above us. <laughs> You know, all we can see maybe is like this dark shadow that we make or that our foot makes. And so it makes it makes perfect sense to me that as um, uh, Ellen White and Patriarchs and Prophets, I think it's around um, page 304, 305, where she discusses um, what it looked like, this huge, thick, dark, black cloud and smoke and lightning surrounding this mountain. And if the people are afraid. And I, I kind of see that as an analogy to, you know, a, an ant being um, surprised by the presence of, of a person or kind of coming to that realization of, okay, there's something big and scary looking that I don't quite understand. And um, so how is God going to try and uh, relate to us other than becoming one of us? And so having that form And then showing us his character. So he's, his long suffering. I mean, we're talking about 2,500 years from Eden to Moses alone. There's a lot of things that, are, that have gone on in that history. But, you know, at the time of Moses, when, when he is bringing the people to the foot of the mountain where God can commune with them and they say no we're fine communing with Moses he's not as as big and imposing and scary as um, a cloud and thunder and a trumpet and lightning we don't understand that Moses we understand the other stuff we don't understand because that's not how we've pictured our God to be. We've pictured our God to be this bull, this powerful creature, uh, or this um, this pharaoh-like God king that crushes the enemies. 
And, you know, so they see this imposing black cloud and they are probably thinking, great, this is going to consume me because I'm an enemy of God because they are fully aware of their sins, of their, um, their false understanding of how they've been seeing and understanding um, God's character. And I realized that I'm about halfway through the notes, so we can pick this up um, next week. I don't want to take us too long. I can't remember when we started, but um, you guys let me know if you want me to stop now or... This is about right. We take a break and then um, and then I pick up. I was just thinking though too about you know like we've all had times where I don't know. I'm just thinking about six thousand years that 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 it takes in terrible form to try to show us who he is to try to have us understand who he is and and I'm picturing it from my own little small scale of. You know, having somebody you might really, really love and you really care about and you're really trying to help and they don't understand you. Yeah. And you can't find a way to help them to understand you. And imagine what that would be like for all this time. Sure. Well, and that's what she's trying to get at, you know, a little bit later is, you know, when she uses the example of um, a person, of her saying to a person that she loves them, but then the person says, okay, well, what, what do you love about me? And, um, hey, keep it down back there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so she's telling this person that, she loves them but this person asks what do you love about me and she just just lists off the things that she likes about herself and then this person you know comes to that realization that okay well you actually don't love me because you're just those things are not true about me they're true about you and, and then she uses another example of somebody telling her that they love her and her saying, well, what is it that, that you think about that when you, you say that you spend all your time thinking about me and you love me, what do you think about? And uh, that person says, well, all of these things that, that I, I love about you and, and Tess said, you know, well, I realize that all those things are not true about me, but they're true about my friend. So you actually don't love me, but you love my friend. And this is the type of relationship that we've established with God, that, that he's calling us to rectify, that it's, it's not the understanding that we've had. It's the understanding that he's showing us. Really beautiful thing. I just as you're going through that is just thinking about the beginning and the end of the great controversy. It ends with God is love, and the whole world mm-hmm. needs to know that God is love. That yeah. part that in all this whole period of time nobody understood, but they're going to understand. Yeah. So we have a ways to go before we get there, but that's what He's showing us. In all right. helping us to understand his character better to show us that we come to grips with understanding his character in a way that we fully understand that God is love. Amen. Well, if anybody has any questions or comments, as a or if nobody has questions or comments, then I'll um, it's just a very to good, close. Sister Alyssa, very good study. I just love how you present it. And I, yeah, I, I think this, to me, this highlight of this presentation, when I watched her, you know, when I watched uh, that uh, presentation was, was really this very fact that that little bit of piece of information that 
the way you read it has everything to do because I read that piece, you know, that in Patriots and Prophets, but I never, you know, it just never caught my eye until until the message came that talks about that we don't understand the nature of, uh, you know, the, the king and his kingdom, and that. Mm -hmm that in and of itself started you know shifting the focus on these little pieces that are so they are they are not so well stressed out in in the scriptures but they yeah. they were there and was it, and it's the same cause the same thing that caused the ancient israel to to misunderstand and and not recognize jesus uh, god himself and it was that um that part where she says that that you know when they were going up the mountain it's them they require they they were scared and they asked moses to go and do it for them because they were scared so they had mm -hmm. fear but it's the same fear that their fear was based on their understanding of their god that their god if their god would be angry he would do this and this and instead, instead of uh, trying to understand and assess the situation in a rational way, not just in a rational way, but it, but to listen to what uh, you know the to the instructions, they simply just come up with their own solution without listening for the instructions. They just said, mm -hmm. "You go for us, and we will just stay here." Mm -hmm. And that's how. And, and since they picked, they chose that way of communicating, that indirect way of communicating, God respected that and he acted upon their request, which is really shocking is because, because that means that, you know, really our, our voice matters. And if we choose not to communicate with God you know, the way that he wants us to, that he's going to do to give us what we want, whether it's good for us or not. Yeah, so that was that. I think that is such a beautiful testimony to God's character. It's that one yeah. of those little precious, beautiful gems that are hidden. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Because, because if try as as he might to get us to understand, um, it didn't work, right? There's so he's working with us as best as he's able the best as we're willing um to learn and unlearn and, and to um to kind of get it right it's, it's kind of the lack for lack of better term but to to restore to um go back to our original nature and um it's just it's a beautiful love story of uh forbearing and uh, the total opposite of an apis bull characteristic, right? Apis bull, you think, you know, bull in a china closet, you just go in and tear the place apart. Um, that's the bull-like like nature, um, hard-headed and, and um, self-confident. And so having that false understanding of, you know, what, what God was to these people in the first 2,500 years of um, the great controversy to now and, and seeing how a lot of people were still asking for that Apis Bull in 2014. So how did, how did God answer us? Uh, not only internally, was um, you know Parmender the um, the true yeah I'm I'm going I'm going there <laughs> with with um, Trump but first I'm going to look internally and we have um, Jeff Pippinger versus um, Elder Parmender and there's this message that Elder Parmender has has been given and yet there's still and and he being you know, foreign, being not from America, um, I can't say immigrant, but um, he's still a, a foreign nationality, I guess, compared to 
uh, the white Christian male of, um, of Protestantism, of that desiring of that apis bull, of that presence of um, you know, strength. And there was no outward display of, um, of power, so to speak, by Elder Parmender in 2014 quite the opposite. What did he do? He withdrew until it was safe kind of for him to come forward with the truth. And it wasn't necessarily him that came forward as much as uh, what I witnessed were people dragging it out of him in 2017, asking him questions about 2014, which made him address that. Um, But so there's this dichotomy, and, and I know in um, many studies, we see Elder Parminder um, kind of lining up with Trump, but this is where there's the quasi and the self-same fractal. So I'm, I'm not looking at this as a self-same fractal, uh, rather taking aspects of the nature of the, the apis bull and looking at the two leaders that we have at the time within our movement but then also how it switches, how it flips. When we look externally and see that there's um, a Donald Trump and a, um, you know, a woman, she's, I can argue that that she's apish, apish bull-like in, you know, the sense that she's very headstrong and, and, almost masculine and in a lot of things that she does and says but in the way that she carries herself but when you compare her to donald trump trump is the the bull hands down so this is where we see next week (laughs) when we finish part two uh where we'll see um how that has affected our our um understanding of god um, hopefully for, for better now that we have, we have a better understanding of, of him now than we did even three years ago. Um, so if there's any other questions or comments. I was just thinking if we can shift, if we were to shift the schedule around, I have to talk to Christine about it, shift the schedule around, um, that, I thought I already had um, myself on the schedule as afternoon next, or maybe it was not next week, but um, the next time I'm on the schedule, I I don't want to take anybody else's spot. Okay. I was just thinking if we could shift something around, then you can finish today and then I can, but but I have one next week as well. So I'll see what, (laughs) what Christine wants to do. Okay. No sweat at all. Can you hear me? I'm, yeah. Yep, go ahead. So uh, I see that you're on the schedule for Sabbath the 28th. Yeah, two weeks from now. Okay. What, what do you guys want to do? Well, I was just, I don't have time to talk to Tony to find out here in the next five minutes necessarily because if, if Tony, because I know that she's kind of struggling, but, I, but that may be a day that everything works out well for her because you could just bump me forward. Um, the one that I have next week forward and then her forward. Um, but I got, I would have to verify that with her on the break. So maybe hang tight and I'll talk to Tony during the break. What does everybody, I mean, I have the structure of the alpha, which is a good study too, but I mean, we may want to stay with this topic through the day. So Sister Elaine, do you want to move your structure of the alpha to, um, and just move all your presentations up? Let me, let me call Tony during the break. And okay. we'll take a 10 minute break and I'll call Tony. Yeah. If I get a hold of her, I'll see what she says. Um, and, uh, and then, um, if so, then I'll jump into her spot. And then the one that I'm supposed to do today, I'll do next week. Okay. So otherwise I'll pick up today. Okay. Okay. So, um, let's, you want to close in prayer? Yeah, actually I'd like to ask brother Saul if he would like to to close in, in prayer. I'd be glad to. Thank you.
Oh, gracious Father, Lord in heaven, Lord, you're an awesome and amazing God. Lord, how you desire our relationship with us. And uh, little by little, you break us down, not in a bad way, not in a mean way, but in a very gentle and kind way so that we have a, a right picture of, of who you are. Your God is, who is most gracious, most compassionate, most gentle and loving. Yeah, sometimes you get angry and I can, yeah, I, I totally understand. That's not your usual nature. You lead us ever so gently. And um, Lord, it's, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just like, when uh, the people, when, when Moses brought the people out um, from Egypt, and uh, when you start speaking, Lord, people are afraid of you. And uh, Lord, for, for thousands and thousands of years, and still yet, we still don't have the right image of who you are. And we ask for the, we ask for forgiveness, Lord, for our, whatever it is that, that keeps a barrier between you and us. Lord, I, I know one day, Lord, it, it's, the barrier is going to come down and we're going to see. You know, even, even the disciples, Lord, after, after being with you for, you know, what, three and a half years, and even after your resurrection, Lord, they, they still didn't understand. And, I, and, and only you know, Lord, what it's going to take for this time for us to really understand uh, who you are. And uh, so we're just forever grateful, Lord, for your, for your long suffering. Indeed, uh, your long suffering toward us. Um, desiring that not one of us will perish. So Lord, all, all, all we can say is thank you. We, we come to you with, with a, a, a grateful heart Acknowledging um, that you are a kind father, wonderful father. And uh, we thank you for continuing to work with us. We thank you for this movement. Um, we thank you for the elders that so gently teach us. And uh, Lord, uh, you know, when they present, Lord, both elders, um, Commander and, 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 and Tess, no, when, when they teach, you know, we, can, we can know and we can feel and we can hear and we can sense um, your love. And um, you know, just, like, I, just like I remember, Lord, when um, you know, President Trump, I, I know some people were fed up with him and you know, calling him names and you know, unbecoming of Christian character. And she said, stop it. And this is not how we treat our enemies. And so we're, we're, we're so grateful Lord, for our teachers. And, and even you know, amongst us, Lord, we're grateful for Sister Alyssa and, 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 and others um, who step up and, and who teach us. And one day, Lord, I, I know, uh, you know if, we're, if we don't have your right character, certainly the world doesn't have your right character. The Methanims, the Levites don't have your right character. And it is up to us, Lord, uh, 144,000, and have your character so that the world can see who you truly are. So we cannot fail in this mission, Lord. We must develop your character so others may see your true character and decide to be on the right side of the issue, to know you and to forsake the world. This is our prayer, Father. Yes, you was wonderful, and then we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.